Deep in the heart of Texas, old habits die hard. But these six shooters aren't aiming to settle a grudge about land or cattle. They're here to break ground for one of the world's largest structures, the very first domed stadium ever built. This stunt and the Houston Astrodome were born in the extraordinary brain of Judge Roy Hoffines. The judge was one of the great Texas originals and had a lot of that Texas uh, character and color and hot air. Hoffines was one of the country's great showmen, with instincts honed by his days as owner of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. The Astrodome was his biggest production yet, one intended to put his beloved Houston on the national map. Opening day in April 1965 was presided over by President Lyndon Johnson himself, along with 21 astronauts from Houston's new NASA Space Center, throwing out the ceremonial first pitch. And for a perfect storybook finish, the great Mickey Mantle hit the first indoor home run in baseball history. This was exactly what Hoff Hines had aimed for. A building grand enough to make Houston a world-famous landmark, the latest in a 2,000-year-old tradition of great domes. The dome represents the sky. Seamless, no angles, no corners, smooth and circular. A symbol of the universe. More than any other great structures, domes are the symbols of what those who build them value most. Domes, coming next on Building Big. If any city needed a covered stadium, it was Houston. It was over 90 degrees in Houston today, and the humidity was through the roof. But here in the Astrodome, it's 72 and dry, as always. I'd much rather watch a ball game in here than out there, and I think most of the fans and players would probably feel the same way. But beyond the need for comfort, there was another reason to build this gigantic dome. From the beginning, the Astrodome was conceived as a way to propel Houston into the big time. Before we had the Astrodome, people forget, for most of its history, Houston was a minor league city. We didn't yet have major league sports. Then as now, any American city that sought major league status had to have its own major league sports team. And while the cure for the minor league blues was obvious enough, the problem for Houston was that it was hard to find major league ball players willing to endure the city's grotesque summers. Just ask those who tried it. It was a trip, playing outdoors, 100 degree weather, humidity 110. The bugs die bummers. <laughs> they had stewardesses on them. <laughs> So to get its coveted team, Houston had to find a way to do what no one had done before, to play the outdoor sport of baseball indoors, in air-conditioned comfort. That's where Judge Hoffines came in. He knew what kind of spectacle he wanted. complete with spacettes as ushers and spacesuit-clad Earthmen to sweep the infield. 
but he still had to figure out how to build the thing. Hofheinz himself specifically chose a dome to do the job, with good reason. The dome shape of the roof was critical for covering a stadium. I mean, imagine trying to cover a space this large with a flat roof. You'd need columns at regular intervals just to keep the roof from collapsing under its own weight. And you could never play baseball or any other kind of sport here, not with all these posts. Although you might get some interesting pinball action, players bouncing off the columns, but that's about it. So the challenge to the builders was clear. Build a roof big enough to cover an entire baseball field and grandstands for 50,000 people without obstructing the players or the views of the spectators. The problem was how to support the weight of such an enormous roof. And here, the dome's curve was the key. A dome can't support itself while it's being built, which is why the Astrodome's roof was constructed on towers in a modern version of an ancient technique called centering. But once the structure was complete, the posts could be removed and the complex curving lattice carried the entire weight of the dome safely out to the walls of the stadium. The result was an unprecedented expanse, the building that Judge Hoffines immediately dubbed the eighth wonder of the world. The great statistic about the Astrodome wasn't that it drew over two million people in its first year of operation to watch the ball games. It's the fact that it drew over a million not to watch the ball games. They would come in and pay a dollar to tour the stadium when it was an empty on an off day on the schedule. But even if the fans marveled at the stadium, the players found that there were a few problems with the idea of indoor baseball that no one had anticipated. The first time the players took the field and worked out, they made a horrifying discovery. Nobody could catch a fly ball. You could not see the ball, and that was a pretty scary experience. Yeah. Pretty scary. The thousands of skylights in the dome acted like a lens, smearing the sun into a blinding wall of light. It blend in with the uh, the roof, the, the, rafters. the rafters, and everything else. But what finally happened was Jimmy Wynn lost a fly ball in the eighth or ninth inning of a very close ball game. And I said, I got it, and <laughs> we let you have it. They let me have it, and uh, we looked at each other. The next thing you know, the crowd was hollering and screaming, and we heard a bang, and the ball took a hop to the center field wall, which was 406 feet away at the time. Yeah. The time we looked at it, the, the runner was uh, at the home plate for inside the park home run. The next day, the work crew started painting the skylights to block the sun. That solved the fly ball problem, but then the specially bred grass designed to grow indoors began to die. They were left with a dirt field that they painted green for television purposes and, and for the aesthetics to make it look good. But it led to a, a, a rather uh, revolutionary change in sports because what the eventual solution turned out to be was something called AstroTurf. And from then on, a generation or two or three of ball players complained endlessly about the AstroTurf ruining their knees. And ultimately, it wasn't just the ball players who complained, it was the public. The Astrodome had been built to shelter the fans from Houston's terrible weather. But when the weather's good, most people prefer to watch and play outdoor sports out of doors. So in spite of the hoopla that surrounded the beginnings of the Astrodome, this is the end of the road. Next season, the Astros play at a new stadium downtown. The new stadium will also be covered, but unlike the Astrodome, its roof will be able to open. The new generation of retractable roof stadiums were created to give fans what they want, a chance to see baseball outside, weather permitting. When the Astrodome opened, people thought it was a building for the ages. but it lasted just 35 years as a working ballpark and as the symbol of a big league city. Now it is little more than a white elephant with a gigantic parking lot. It's a sad come down.
and a demonstration of how the role of the dome has changed over time. This was no pleasure palace. Rather, it was the first great dome built purely to make a point. The Pantheon is the supreme, tangible, touchable, visible symbol of the Roman Empire that we have. The Pantheon was the only temple in Rome dedicated to all the gods. And it proclaimed that the Roman Empire was not just the center of civilization, it had the sanction of heaven too. There's something about this building that begs to be sketched, and yet is impossible to capture in any one drawing. First of all, it's huge. You can't see it in a single glance. Then there's that circle of light that comes through the oculus in the roof. It's like some sign from the heaven comes down and grabs you. Everything about the Pantheon was meant to impress and even intimidate all who came here. This transcendent building where all the gods gathered to give Rome the authority and the power to rule the world. Or more bluntly, the Pantheon was specifically conceived as propaganda, built to serve the immediate political ends of one of the ancient world's truly innovative rulers, Hadrian, Emperor of Rome. We cannot separate the design and meaning of the Pantheon from Hadrian's personality. It couldn't have been done unless Hadrian wanted it done. And because he was an accomplished architect himself, we have to say that he was deeply influential in the making of the building and the designing of it. But for Hadrian, the Pantheon was more than an architectural statement. It was built to drive home the message that he was in charge. His immediate predecessor, Trajan, had pushed the borders of the empire to its greatest extent ever. When Trajan died in 117, Hadrian made the most radical decision a Roman ruler could make. When Hadrian came to power, he withdrew the armies from what we now call Iraq and the northern part of Arabia, which was not a popular move, but he did it because they could not sustain the armies there, and because Hadrian had to consolidate himself with the fierce, proud generals that had been trained in the previous reign, and probably didn't care much for Hadrian. Hadrian knew that no Roman emperor could survive if his subjects saw him as weak. So he looked for ways to demonstrate that he remained the most powerful man in the world. To distract the masses, Hadrian sponsored six days of gladiators battling in Rome's amphitheaters. And on his birthday, he sponsored the slaughter of a thousand beasts. but Hadrian wanted to create something more permanent. A monumental structure that would declare that his empire and its emperor were invulnerable. Almost all great public buildings in the ancient world were rectangular, with roofs held up by rows of columns. It was Hadrian's stroke of genius to realize that a dome could transform a building into a symbol of something much larger than itself. The Pantheon contains the idealized circumference of the empire in a circle and a representation of the heavens in a half of a sphere, that is the dome itself. The dome did not come to the Romans by chance. It emerged out of a form they used for bridges, buildings, and aqueducts, the arch. Roman builders realized that if they rotated the arch in a circle, it would become this symmetrical, strong, three-dimensional shape, a dome. 
which was first used for such everyday buildings as baths. But even such small structures revealed the virtue of the form. Domes create totally open interior spaces. The Pantheon was designed to accommodate vast crowds, but its size reveals the fundamental engineering problems of all domes. At the top of a dome, the curve of the walls pushes inwards towards the center, creating a force called compression. This force holds the masonry in a rigid shape. At the top, it is even possible to make a hole or oculus because compression makes the rim strong and stable. But about halfway down, the weight of the structure begins to push the sides outward, creating a stress called tension. Tension caused cracks to appear in the bottom portion of the Pantheon. To keep their dome from collapse, Hadrian's builders added enormous layers of concrete called step rings. They push straight down, holding the dome of the Pantheon in place by redirecting the entire weight of the structure safely down towards the Pantheon's thick walls. Hadrian's engineers also had to find ways to lighten their dome, and their solutions are a classic case of engineering skill producing great art. The oculus, that opening at the top of the dome, eliminates some mass while creating the daily light show for which the Pantheon is famous. These intricate shapes, called coffers, also eliminate some masonry, and the Romans used low-density concrete near the top of the dome to reduce the weight even further. The result was an almost impossibly huge dome, one that would remain the world's largest for 1,500 years. The idea of the empire as being a creation of one ruler is very present in the Pantheon. Which was, of course, Hadrian's point. The man who could gather all the gods of Rome under one roof had nothing to fear in the human world. But no empire can stand forever. And as the old gods fell before a new Christian faith, Rome itself succumbed to barbarian invasion, leaving only a diminished Eastern Empire centered on a new capital, Constantinople, modern Istanbul. Here in the early 500s, the Christian Emperor Justinian crushed a revolt that left 35,000 dead. In the wake of that slaughter, he desperately needed to prove that he still had the divine right to rule. So he ordered work begun on a magnificent church to be called Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom. And to make sure the message was clear, Justinian appropriated the old pagan symbol of heaven and ordered that his great church should be crowned by a dome. It was that dome that made Hagia Sophia the most complex building of antiquity. Before Hagia Sophia, almost all Christian churches had straight roofs on rectangular or square bases. So when Justinian wanted to put a dome on the grandest church in Christendom, he found himself in something of a geometric fix. I mean, imagine trying to put a circle on top of a square. Fortunately, Justinian's architects came up with an elegant and practical solution to the problem. They built four massive piers at each corner of the square. On top of the piers, they built four arches. They then filled the spaces between the arches with masonry to create these curved triangular shapes called pendentives. The pendentives and the tops of the arches combined to create a strong base for the dome. Every large dome built on a square base uses the pendentive. This imitation is not mere flattery. It's simply a recognition of the fact that the builders here solved one of the few fundamental problems of dome architecture in a way that so far no one has bettered. 
Most important, to Justinian at least, Hagia Sophia's dome placed on the high arches of the pendentive system towered over his city and his subjects. Hagia Sophia would remain the symbol of Constantinople's Christian rulers for the next 900 years, until the day when the forces of a younger faith, Islam, brought an end to Christian power over the city. Time and again, the Ottoman armies had conquered Christian cities. The young sultan of the Ottoman Turks, Mehmet II, was encamped outside the great walls of Constantinople. Tried again and again to get in, and it was repulsed. On the 29th of May in 1453, they made a breach. The Turkish soldiers filled the city and immediately rushed through to the great buildings, pillaging, robbing, enslaving, murdering. The Sultan himself rode through the city to the great church. At Hagia Sophia, Mehmet found his forces already looting the building. And then, so the story goes, he drew his sword and struck a column with a ferocious blow. Get out, he cried, sack the city, but leave this place alone. With that, Mehmet transformed the world's most famous Christian church into a mosque. And it would become the inspiration for the most exuberant flowering of the dome form in the history of architecture. The man behind this creative explosion was Sinan, an architectural genius who remains largely unknown beyond Turkey. He worked for the greatest sultan of them all, Suleiman, styled the Magnificent. Suleiman ordered Sinan to build a unique mosque, one that would demonstrate that the dome could be an unequivocally Islamic symbol. His goal was to create an Islamic structure, a religious structure that was compatible with the tenets of Islam, in which openness and light were extremely important. A mosque is a very egalitarian structure, open to everybody. There is no separate section for the king. There is no separate section for the religious leaders. Everybody prays in an open area. Sinan based many of his mosques, including Suleiman's, on the design of the Hagia Sophia. But his greatest achievement was to soar far past the ancient church in his use of windows and the play of light beneath the dome. The earliest great domes, like the Pantheon, had been solid except for the oculus at the top, for fear that windows would lead to their collapse. But in time, ancient engineers realized that they could think of a dome as a circular ring of arches, rather than as a single monolithic shell. That meant that they could open up the spaces between these arch-shaped segments into windows. Sinan pushed the use of windows much further in his domed mosques in an experiment that culminated here, in a building that some say he meant as a love letter. The rumors were that Sinan, by now an old man, was in love with a woman beyond his reach. The princess Mirama, Suleiman's daughter, who was trapped in a loveless marriage. 
And so Sinan built this mosque for her and infused it with all the passion that neither could express in words. That single tower, the minaret, gives us one hint that the story of unrequited passion might be true. As the Sultan's daughter, Miramah was entitled to two minarets. But it is said she ordered Sinan to stop at one as a symbol of her desperate loneliness. In my opinion, this is the single most beautiful building he ever built any place. Here is a dome simply supported by four arches. And these four sides of the structure are pierced by windows all the way around. It is the lightest structure he has ever built and it is open. The Miramar Mosque was a true virtuoso performance, Sinan's demonstration of how far art and engineering could push the form. But in the mid-16th century, he wasn't the only one experimenting with the dome. At the same time, across the Mediterranean in Italy, some of the greatest minds of the Renaissance were struggling to solve the problem of how to build the most dramatic dome the world had ever seen. In Rome, the ambition of a pope set in motion a construction project that would last a century. Old St. Peter's, the main church at the Vatican, was a typical Roman rectangular building. And at 1,200 years old, it was too small and decrepit to impress anyone. So in 1506, following the example of emperors and sultans, Pope Julius II seized on a dome as the symbol that could assert the church's authority and his own. In Rome, any great dome had to reckon with the Pantheon, and the first design for the new St. Peter's, preserved in this Vatican medallion, was a barely camouflaged effort to one-up the old temple. It was proposed by the leading architect, Donato Bramante. Bramante approaches the new dome by revisiting the idea behind the dome of the Pantheon. But he multiplies the design challenges. His dome is even bigger than that of the Pantheon, because he wants to prove what a skilled architect he is by taking the best from ancient architecture and making it even more complicated, thus surpassing the brilliance of the ancient masters. As he began work, Bramante feared competition, especially from a young artist from Florence who was rising fast in the Pope's esteem. His name, Michelangelo. To sidetrack his rival, Bramante persuaded the Pope to order Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of his personal sanctuary, the Sistine Chapel. Bramante expected Michelangelo, a sculptor and not a painter, to botch the job. Which proved somewhat of an error in judgment. But even with this extraordinary display of talent, Michelangelo still didn't get the commission for St. Peter's when Bramante died in 1514. Not long afterward, Michelangelo left Rome in disgust. For more than two decades, a succession of lesser talents took over the work, including Antonio Sangallo, who proposed this design. Michelangelo could not hold himself back. Not only was the dome ugly, he wrote, but the vast, ungainly bay was a perfect hiding place for rascals and rapers of nuns, not to mention that the proposed church would have eliminated his beloved Sistine Chapel. That was unthinkable, declared Michelangelo, and the Pope agreed. And so, at last, 30 years after he painted the Sistine ceiling, 
Michelangelo gained total control over the construction of St. Peter's. He was 72. Michelangelo's new design was tied to a religious vision that Bramante lacked. Michelangelo had this vision of a temple that will represent the world in its totality, the human world symbolized by the base. And the divine world above, symbolized by the big dome with its perfect circular shape. But as Michelangelo reached his 80s, he realized he would not live to complete his great dome. And so he commissioned this model, somewhat modified later, to serve as a three-dimensional blueprint for a dome that was not quite the diameter of the Pantheon, but that would soar much, much higher. Visible proof that heaven and earth met at this one place, the center of the Roman Catholic Church. To support such a giant dome, the builders embedded three iron chains or rings within the masonry structure, which acted like hoops on a barrel, holding back the outward thrust of tension. The dome was finally completed in 1604, but its unprecedented size and weight overwhelmed the tension rings intended to hold it in place. Significant cracks developed, each meticulously monitored and mapped onto the model. By the early 18th century, the fear of collapse prompted Vatican engineers to add several more tension rings in an emergency fix that has stood the test of time. But even so, the warning was clear enough. This was as big as you could build with traditional masonry construction. Building new, huge domes would require a radical new approach. In America, engineering breakthroughs would speed the transformation of great domes from religious symbols into civic ones. This change was brought about by George Washington, the man who would not be king. America's revolutionary hero had rejected the idea of a monarchy, and to drive the point home, he would have the capital crowned with a dome. An inspired choice, since there were no domes in North America, and Washington himself had never seen one. Washington wanted a dome here because it would set the capital above and beyond everything else in the country. And Washington realized that the grander the capital was, the more unique it was, the more respect it would have among the citizens who were looking at this infant government with a degree of skepticism. Designs were solicited for the new dome. Washington favored this Pantheon-style structure, though it was rather plain. But given the other choices, well, the Capitol could have turned out to be quite a building. The final choice, completed in 1824, was a profound disappointment. The first dome of the Capitol was made of wood. Aside from its appearance, which no one liked, it was also a fire trap. On Christmas Eve in 1851, there was quite a scare. not been for a detachment of Marines who came to the Capitol with their axes and chopped down a wooden staircase connecting the library with the dome. The dome very likely would have gone up in smoke that day.
And had that happened, the entire building would have been destroyed. A Philadelphia architect named Thomas U. Walter was ordered to replace the old dome as part of a project to enlarge the Capitol to accommodate a Congress that was growing as rapidly as the nation. He proposed a design that would at last fulfill George Washington's desire for a dome grand enough to celebrate American democracy. But it would not be easy. The designers of the Capitol soon ran into the same old problem, how to build a taller, heavier dome without its walls cracking or pushing outward. Here's a point of comparison. Here's that dome, and here's Washington's original choice. Now, to create a dome of this size would require massive walls like the Pantheon, or lots of chains like St. Peter's, or even rebuilding the whole thing. Well, they didn't want to do that. So instead, they came up with a brilliant bit of engineering trickery. That dome is really a thin shell a facade. And the structure that holds up the facade is a ring of curved iron ribs, 36 of them. I've just drawn two. We don't see them, but they hold up the dome that we can see from the outside. Underneath is a smaller dome, open at the top like the Pantheon. And that's what you see from inside the Capitol. And outside, the high dome-shaped shell is an illusion too. Though it looks like it's built of stone, every bit of the Capitol Dome, from the columns to the ornamentation, is made of cast iron, molded and shaped to look like the stone building it crowns. This is what these coffers really look like from the other side. This is the space between the domes. And this is one of the 36 supporting ribs. In fact, it's number 33. The outer shell is actually bolted to this rib, sort of like being in the hull of an iron ship. To my right, you can see the curve of the inner dome. It's self-supporting, but it's still attached to the ribs. The best thing about building with iron, as opposed to stone, is that you can cast pieces in almost any size and shape you want, and then assemble them like some huge erector set. It makes building a structure like this go a lot faster. And its iron shell would never suffer the cracking that plagued its masonry predecessors. The building of the Great Dome began smoothly enough. But the outbreak of the Civil War threatened the entire project. Many questioned whether construction could or even should continue on something so unnecessary as a dome. Lincoln saw the dome as a powerful symbol of national resolve that our country would continue whole and united. To people who asked him why the dome was continuing, why spend money on something that did not contribute to the war effort? And he reminded these people that it did contribute to the war effort symbolically. As both the work and the war continued, Lincoln was proved right. The Capitol was an extraordinarily powerful symbol for a Union under siege. I can imagine a soldier coming to the city of Washington, a factory worker from Massachusetts, for instance, or a, a farmer from upstate New York, who's never been more than 20 miles from his home. And suddenly, he's in the Union Army. And he's on the mall, and. On the eastern edge of that mall, there is the capital of the United States, which he has seen for the first time. What really impresses him is the sight of that great white dome rising slowly but steadily over the center of the building. And the fact that it was being continued, the fact that it was being built despite the clash of arms was inspirational. The dome was finally completed in December 1863, and it would serve as America's national shrine within days of the war's end. The assassinated president, Abraham Lincoln, was brought to lie in state under the dome in the Capitol's rotunda.
The dome of the Capitol remains the preeminent symbol of American strength and idealism. And despite its classical look, the dome's iron construction signaled a new era, one in which iron and steel and an exploding population would change the face of the urban world. This new age would spawn new and bigger buildings, from skyscrapers to train stations. Like St. Pancras Station in London, built with the same technologies as the Capitol Dome. Enormous spans could be covered with the new materials of iron and steel. And by the 20th century, this technological transformation would evoke one of the few truly new ideas about dome construction in 2,000 years, the geodesic dome. This creation was spawned by one of the 20th century's genuine originals, Buckminster Fuller. Bucky was, of course, the great proselytizer of the dome. The name became symbolic with dome. Buckminster Fuller sincerely believed that domes could meet any urban need. From a single home, to this gleefully outlandish plan to roof over all of midtown Manhattan. It's possible to be a brilliant designer, a charlatan, and a salesman all at once, perhaps, and, and maybe Fuller was some of all of those things. Still, there was little evidence in Fuller's early career as a backyard inventor that he would transform himself into a cult hero. Here's Ford Auto with only three wheels. Watch your step. His bizarre-looking car, for example, could turn on a dime, but it did have some problems staying upright. And his later idea for roundhouses inspired by grain silos also failed to catch on. No matter, Fuller still had every confidence in himself and in the design breakthroughs that he knew lay just down the road. In the summer of 1948, Fuller traveled to the North Carolina hills to take up a job at a tiny unknown art school called Black Mountain College. There, Fuller preached his personal gospel, that geometry contained fundamental truths that could reshape the entire human environment. He had a passion, a passionate belief that the world could be ordered, and if we would only just sort of fix this and this and this and do this this way and do that that way, everything would be fine. It was almost naive in a certain way. There was a kind of innocence to it. Fuller believed he had found his ultimate answer to all ills. In a dome, one unlike any ever seen before, to be constructed by his student disciples. Fuller was extremely charismatic. He could convince a group of art students that they were doing something that was a waste of time making art, that they should be recreating the world in his image. The dome that he wanted to build out of these fragile aluminum parts was to be a 50-foot diameter hemisphere. Unfortunately, it was too floppy even to anticipate making it stronger because it turned out to be like a lot of white spaghetti in the grass. By now, used to failure, Fuller simply went back to the drawing board. Ultimately, he found his solution in the humble triangle. Triangles are inherently strong. They can be pushed or pulled without easily deforming. So for his dome, Fuller began to explore three-dimensional shapes built out of triangles. And he quickly latched on to the icosahedron, which has 20 triangular faces. He divided each face into smaller and smaller triangles until the icosahedron transformed into a sphere. He then just cut the sphere in half to create the shape Fuller called a geodesic dome, a curved form created entirely out of discrete triangular elements, which then could be covered by almost any material. Light, strong, cheap, and often genuinely elegant, Fuller's domes sprouted everywhere. 
used for almost every conceivable purpose. The United States military became an enthusiastic fan of geodesic domes, using them for everything from radar enclosures to field shelters for Marines. It is one of the minor ironies of the 60s that the other great geodesic enthusiasts were the hippies. Happenings like these served as the launching pad for Fuller's second career as an all-purpose guru to the counterculture generation. I'm going to run a moving picture of you in a, in a backwards manner. <laughs> Anyone who has ever listened to one of the lectures, which dragged on for hours and sometimes even a day. And all the food comes out of your mouth and on the plate and then the scene is very remote. You would find that you couldn't follow the sense of what he was saying clearly. Einstein said quite clearly, our universe is an aggregate of non-simultaneous and only partially overlapping events. Each one of these is how then the metaphysical man as mine could become the master of the physical. It is then the synergy he which kept talking and never stopped. With the moon. And it's Ultimately, it didn't matter what he said. It was Fuller's dome that made him a hero and never more spectacularly than at the United States Pavilion at the 1967 World Expo in Montreal. No one had ever seen anything like it. It was gigantic. At 250 feet in diameter, it dwarfed the Pantheon. It was Fuller's most public triumph. He managed more clearly than almost anybody else in the 20th century to make sense out of certain basic structural truths and use them to make very beautiful things. And for that alone, I think he deserves to be remembered. But this was as good as it got. In 1968, the Montreal Dome's plastic skin caught fire and burned in just 20 minutes. The structure was unoccupied at the time of the fire and no one was hurt. But the disaster ended Fuller's dream of building a truly huge geodesic dome. Still, Fuller does have a connection to the Georgia Dome, which is for now the largest clear span in the world. It's really almost a small city, big enough for 70,000 people and all the services needed for a crowd that size. It all depends on this enormous roof, 840 feet across. The roof is our wow factor. When we opened the building in 1992, everyone who walked out into the bowl and looked up went wow. I think a lot of people wanted to know initially about the roof. Will it fall down? How does it stay up there? The answer lies with an engineering breakthrough, one that Fuller dubbed tensegrity. Translated from Fuller's speak, the idea of tensegrity begins with the notion of a circus tent, where vertical poles carry the compressive weight of the roof above. But to create an unobstructed stadium floor, those posts have to be cut off in midair. And that's where tension comes in, in the form of pre-stretched cables attached top and bottom to each post. The posts are held in place by the cables, which pull with equal force in all directions to form strong, taut triangles that ultimately connect to the perimeter of the dome. It is this precise dance of tension and compression that allows tensegrity roofs to fly appearing to defy gravity far above the stands and the playing field below. Buckminster Fuller recognized the potential of tensegrity back in the 1950s, and he even patented the concept. The only problem is that it wasn't his idea in the first place. The concept of tensegrity really came from uh, Kenneth Snelson. He's a sculptor. 
Snelson first came up with his tensegrity sculptures after working with Fuller at Black Mountain College. I was thinking in terms of form and structure. I wasn't trying to build a bridge or a column or a, or a sphere. Uh, I saw immediately that one could do something sculpturally quite fascinating with it. But what happened when Snelson showed Fuller his first tensegrity sculpture still rankles. His reaction right away indicated to me that he was very pleased. And he turned it over in his hand and finally said, can may I keep this? It was very exciting at first with, uh, with, with Bucky and until uh, he decided to publish uh, what I had done as his own work, uh, <laughs> we got along fine. Snelson is now receiving the credit he deserves for Tensegrity which, as he foresaw, can generate both striking sculpture and ultimately domes far more ambitious than the Georgia Dome, to be built in places much more exotic than Atlanta. The city of St. Louis isn't generally thought of as a jungle paradise, and yet here the rainforest flourishes, covered by a geodesic dome called the Climatron. Now, the Climatron was never intended to be a single open space. It's an entire habitat, protected from the inhospitable climate outside. And perhaps the Climatron can be seen as a prototype for the ultimate and truly otherworldly use for a dome. If we're to achieve our dream of colonizing the moon and other planets, we'll need to bring with us into outer space whole environments sheltered by domes in which life can flourish no matter how harsh the conditions may be. And it's a powerful thought that after 2,000 years of building domes as symbols of the heavens, the greatest domes human beings may ever create will take us up there, right into the dome of the sky. And I'm Kenny. We're from the PBS Kids Show Zoom. At Zoom, kids send us letters all the time, challenging us to build things. Recently, Ms. Shue's third grade class in Brookline, Massachusetts, challenged us to build a miniature model of a geodesic dome. Building a model is a great way to learn about science and the steps engineers go through to build big things in the real world. After this project, I'll know a whole lot more about what it takes to construct something huge like a dome on top of a building. Here's what Ms. Shue's class asked us to do. Dear Zoom, we just learned about geodesic domes. These are domes made of a pattern of connected triangles. Geodesic domes are supposed to be very strong. Do you think you could use newspaper and masking tape to build one that you could climb on? Wow, that sounds hard. Masking tape and newspaper seems pretty flimsy to me. Why don't you try this project at home after you see the dome we come up with. Here's what you'll need. A big sack of newspapers like this and a whole lot of masking tape. Give yourself about three hours to build the dome and make sure you have a large open space to work in. Here are some things to keep in mind. Some geodesic domes are built with two different kinds of triangles. A large triangle with three equal sides and a smaller triangle with one side the same length and two other sides 15% shorter. To make a dome large enough to climb on, you'll need about 55 large triangles and 25 small ones. Ask some friends to help you. The large triangle should have eight inch sides. The trick is to arrange the large and small triangles into patterns that can be joined to form the dome shape. Now it's our turn to build the dome. But remember, 
The way we make it is not the only way. So be sure to try out your own ideas. And then you just keep adding triangles. Okay. Okay. So, well, what should we do? Newspaper is, it's very, very flimsy weak. and weak. Maybe we could roll it up. Maybe that will work. Okay. But Make it like with a small. Okay. Make it tight by turning it to pinky. So well, let's let's like fold it into a triangle first. Okay. All right. So we're gonna fold maybe like a little bit on this side, and then go like like that. So let's so take that take right it. there. Oh. Okay. Is it sturdy? Yeah, that's really strong. Oh wow. So we need to make some more like these ones. We have a pile of big triangles and a pile of small triangles that you made. And we have to, I think we should try to put them together to make a, our dome. Okay. But we have to figure out how we're going to do it. Okay. But do you want to divide the dome up into sections while we make it? Do you want to? Here, where's that marker? Okay. So here's the dome. Yep. Do you want to divide the dome up into Big, big tri triangles, yeah. And then after we make each big individual triangles. big triangle that has all the little triangles inside, we can make that into a big dome. A big dome. Now we have to figure out how to put them together. Okay. What if we made a hexagon or something like that with with the big triangles? Hexagon is it's like it's six si sides. six triangles, yeah. And then like this. Say, yeah, but we need. Like this, and then we had, huh? Then we had say one on top, that. and then maybe, then we would need like two we, small ones on this side. Yeah, and then like that. Need, so it makes a triangle. Yeah, and then it could even be a longer, because that way it has more support. Like, that means we need. What like, if we like see how this is like half a hexagon? What mm -hmm. if we continued it like that? They made another one over here. See how that's like half like yep. of a hexagon? We took some more big ones, put them like this, and then took two but small ones and put them on the ends, just like it's another triangle. Like that. Let's move this up a little bit. Like this. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Wow, that's awesome. And okay. then you make like that we more of these, and then when you tape them together, they should curve. You put them all together, what do you get? A big dome. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, let's so let's start. Taping. start. <sighs> nice. 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 Okay. Put this. So, I think we should tape all these middle parts together first. And then once we tape in, like lift it up a little bit, and uh -huh. so we can tape each like little section oh, okay. together until... That'll take us a long time. I'm done. Okay. I think that's it. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. okay. Maybe she just lay across. Okay. Oh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Woo! That worked. It seems like though it's Too like bad. wide on the bottom, which makes it slide. So if it was like more like higher or vertical or pressed together, it, was, it would so hold more weight was. because if it was up, it'd be nice and tight and compact. And I think we should like take a triangle from a section, another triangle from another section, and like 
bend it up and tape them together so it's not only higher but stronger okay. and can hold more weight. Okay. But right. do you think it can hold some heavy telephone books or heavy it books? It should be able to. It's a little weak in the middle, but everything else is really, really strong. Okay, let's test it. I'll go get some. Okay. Finished? Oh, it looks like a star. Okay, ready? Yep. Okay. One. Yay! Yep. Two. Oh. Whoa, that's a heavy one. Whoa, Ooh. three, four, four, oh, heavy, wow. four heavy books. Good job. Ready? That's fantastic. Ah. Oh, shoot. Ah. Ah. Okay. Uh, okay, so we got, we got four. four. four so I think that's all it's going to be able to hold. You may not be able to go on top, but you can go inside. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Good job. Even though the dome didn't support me, it was pretty strong. That's because of the triangles. Here's how they work. When weight is added to any dome, two forces result. Near the top, compression pushes the materials together. And near the bottom, tension pulls the materials apart. Many domes were built with several heavy rings, called tension rings, to solve this problem. But triangles, a strong balanced shape, aren't deformed by these forces. In a geodesic dome, they direct the weight straight down to the base, where only one tension ring is needed. The result is one of the most elegant and efficient structures ever designed. For more tips and information, check out the activity instructions that came with your video, and don't forget to visit the Building Big website. Building Big continues at PBS Online. Meet engineers, explore big structures near you, and experiment in a virtual lab at pbs.org. five-part Building Big Boxed Set and the companion book by David McCauley are available from WGBH Boston Video. To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424. Educators, ask about our Building Big Curriculum Kit.